Well, hey, everybody, thanks again for joining us. We have been in a series that started a couple weeks ago uh, called The Bible Says on the Weekend, and then we've been paralleling it each week, uh, kind of talking about what does it look like to go a little deeper into some of those areas. Uh, this week, we have been talking about really this uh, period in the Hebrew scriptures where God uh, not only rolled out the law, like we talked about on Monday, uh, but then yesterday we talked specifically about this period of the judges and what they did. And today we're going to talk about kings. I'll kind of give you a brief intro on that. And then we're going to talk about one king uh, who was actually awesome. So that's good. That'll feel nice. A little bit of <laughs> little bit of a change there. Uh, and so um, hopefully that'll be helpful for you. Uh, as I've done this week, I've tried to find that like summary video. If you want to go check that out on YouTube where it'll break down first and second Kings. Um, the thing about first and second Kings, we read it like it's two books, but it's actually one. Um, and so just a thing to know about why did they break it up? Because it seemed too long. Yeah. But Psalms is really long. And so is Genesis. So is Job. No they probably were like, oh, man, these guys are just going to need a breather. Right. Just take a break. Take a break in the middle of Judges. Crystal said, uh, being an avid gardener, I wasn't ready for all my beauties to die. So I was pretty frustrated how hard of freeze we got so early uh, I fa the fall season. I should have enjoyed my backyard for two more months. But the Lord giveth and taketh <laughs> away. That's funny. All right. So before we get into it, Lisa, would you pray for us? Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, God. Uh, God, we just thank you so much for this morning, for this opportunity that we can be together. And uh, God, for just an opportunity to reflect on the seasons and how things change. Uh, God, we thank you that we live in a place where we actually have seasons. And um, pray that you would just help us today as we are looking into kind of a rough season for Israel and uh, how Josiah stands out in the season, uh, what he does. And how we can take what he did and learn from it and apply lessons from Israel and from Josiah to our lives today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. So uh, yesterday, as I mentioned, we were in the period of Judges. And so uh, today we're going to jump into Kings. There's a little bit of kind of bridge that I'll give you here in just a second. As is always the case, we welcome your feedback. We would love your questions, ideas. Uh, obviously this week is a little teaching heavy because of how much ground we're covering. Uh, but today should feel a little different than that because we're just covering kind of a specific singular king that actually doesn't get, we we're talking about this before we jumped on today, mm -hmm. like doesn't get as much credit as it feels like you should. Um, but between the last time that Israel, we were with Israel yesterday and today, uh, they've had these periods of judges. We saw that line, right? There's no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Every other nation had a king, but the contrast was God really wanted judges to work to institute what he wanted, prophets to be his voice to the people and to the judge, and then him to be their king. But over time, Israel kept saying, but how about like all those other ones? Like they really, they have kings. We want kings like they have. And we talked about the pressure that Israel felt because all these other nations around them did it totally different uh, and had a completely different system of faith. And so eventually God was like, okay. Here you go. And so their first king was King Saul. Um, and Saul looked the part. He was a head taller than everybody else and then went really sideways. Uh, and then David comes along and David does some incredible, incredible stuff, really is responsible for kind of bringing Israel back into this place of unity. Um, but then kings basically do this up and down, good and bad pendulum swing generation after generation for a really long time. And so we're going to get to see some of that. But where we're going to drop into is with the person, the king, uh, Josiah. And so uh, any other preliminary thoughts, ma'am, before we talk about Josiah? Yeah, well, in, in, in the middle of all of this, too, we see the kingdom of Israel break into two parts, really yep. over a kingship. Uh, and so we talked about David, his son was Solomon. And then Solomon had uh, a son who just kind of lost his mind a little bit. Uh, and it was through him. And then um, was it a servant of his or like a, not another son, but anyway, Israel breaks into two parts, Judah and another one become the Southern kingdom. 
uh, and the rest of the 12 tribes of Israel become the Northern Kingdom. Uh, the Northern Kingdom remains Israel. Judah is called Judah. And so when we start to talk about the kings of, of Israel or the kings of Judah, that's what we're talking about. Awesome. So I think, you know, when you, and it's Judah and Benjamin are the two tribes. I thought that's what it was, but I wasn't sure. I looked it up. I did not know that. <laughs> oh, nothing. Um, so, you know, you have Israel redivided within the kingdoms and you just have some like really, really terrible kings, like just people that you're like, how could you possibly think that the God of Moses and Abraham, Jacob, like, how could you possibly think that he would want you to do like institute child sacrifice? Like, it's crazy to think about the stuff that Kings did. And then Josiah, I think gives us a hint into why that was the case, like how we got to that point. So introduce us a little bit to Josiah. So Josiah comes, um, really after a, a couple very, very bad kings. And you know they're bad because when they're introduced by the author, it tells you what their name was, how old they were when they started uh, their kingship, um, how long they reigned. And then they use the phrase most often, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord as his father so-and-so had done. And so we see that over and over and over again. Uh, but here we get to Josiah, and although he comes in a long after a long line of very evil kings, it says here that Josiah, first of all, was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned for 31 years. Um, it tells you what his mother's name is, which I think is interesting because that's not always the case. And then we hear the phrase in verse two, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in all the ways. And then they're going to go all the way back to, to bring um, the people who are reading this back to a good King David. Um, and he did not turn aside to the right or to the left. And I mean, what a huge callback. And even at this point with everything that David had done wrong at the end of his life, what he'd accomplished for Israel was still seen as this kind of incredible, you know, like when we think back to founding fathers kind of stuff, like that's the the scale to which people thought about David. And uh, yeah, taking over to eight feels crazy. Uh, but I have an eight year old. I think Maisie would make a pretty good king, actually. So maybe I mean, she would for she, sure. She'd, she'd be in charge. That's for sure. That is for <laughs> sure. So Tom, by the way, talking about bad kings, said he heard a message about a Rehoboam and Jeroboam called Throw the Bones Out. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's good. That's clever. And seriously, I mean, if you want to put to shame any soap opera that you've ever laid eyes on or late night drama, I mean, Judges is a good place to start, but read through the Kings. They were amazing. I mean, it's just amazing that humanity has slipped so far. And and like you alluded to, we'll, we'll kind of get to why that happened. But the other thing that we didn't talk about, Phil, is that, um, and this was mind blowing to me when I finally figured it out that the prophets that will come later in um, in the order of our Bibles, these prophets actually parallel the the kings that we're reading through. Mm -hmm. and yep. So uh, we, we've talked before about how the Bible is not in order. It's in sections. And so you'll you'll hear prophets names in here and you'll be like, is that the same Isaiah that comes later? Yes, it is. And so when you see that name of a prophet, remember it it actually is the prophet that you'll get to if you're reading your Bible in order, or you can just flip straight to it and hear a little bit more about what was going on. Yep. Yep. Awesome. All right. So Josiah takes over eight years old. He's going to grow into a pretty amazing King. What happens next? So um, he decides to send some guys up to the house of the Lord. So um, to the temple and he really is just wanting them to deliver some money. Uh, but while they're there and they're repairing the the temple from some damage um, but while they're there one of the guys comes up to hilkiah who's the high priest and he says and i don't know how he said it but he says this word these words in verse eight i have found the book of the law in the house of the lord it it, it had been missing and I don't know how big it was. And it wasn't a book like we read today. It was it was scrolls. But how did that go missing? 
And then you and then you flip back and you go, oh, I know how this went missing, because the kings and and the priests had gone sideways. And when and when we go sideways, those books get pushed aside until finally you don't know where they are anymore. They're just misplaced. But I mean, like the I don't know, like the um, the thing that's tricky, right? Uh, it, is that two things I think are true. One, this is probably a lot more like us than we want to admit, right? Like you've probably got a Bible on your shelf you haven't touched in a while, right? And so for them, they didn't have, this didn't exist in a bunch of different places. The yeah. the Bible wasn't ubiquitous like it is today. Nobody's pulling out their smartphone. Nobody's jumping on daily time with God on social media. Um, they're just living their lives and they were in an agrarian world where living your life was what you had to do every day if you wanted to survive. Right. And so very different, you know, it's easy for us to look at it and go, how could they? But I, I, they, I think in our own way, we sort of do the same thing. Um, the other thing to know is we're not talking about the entire old Testament. So right. Cause we're reading it right, right now. So it wasn't like, like this weird inception moment where he's reading about himself. Um, that this is the Torah. <laughs> Uh, this is the pen, you know, the first five books essentially of the Hebrew scriptures that break down what God did in the life of Israel and the law. And, um, and, and so it's going to be a lot smaller. It was only in one place. Uh, they were already creating resources that would have had excerpts from it that would have been getting taught, but they weren't teaching directly from it. It was very, very, it was held in very high regard. And so it was probably kind of like under lock and key type of a deal. Um, but yeah, all of a sudden it all makes sense. You're like, well, why didn't that guy, why didn't he know more about God? Like, why would he think that God would want him to do that? Well, the Torah was already revealing less about God than we know from a full canon. So that's the, we're already at a little bit of a loss. They're, they're functioning in a place where God's primary concern for Israel was, I hope you don't get unduly influenced by cultures around you. And they did. Mm -hmm. And then in addition to all that, they're not reading it. And so, you know, like, yeah, I see why you could go like, what's your frame of reference? Your frame of reference is, well, we're not bad as that nation. We're not as bad as them. And, uh, and so Josiah, uh, I mean, he has an opportunity as to what he's going to do with the book of the law and what does he do with it? Yeah. So, so they bring it to him and I love his response in verse 11. It says when the King heard the words, cause they were reading it to him of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. So this was a sign of mourning. <clears throat> and then he says like, Hey, we got, we've got to inquire of the Lord. <laughs> what's going to happen to us because this is bad. We we have not done well as a nation. And so in 13, he says, go inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all of Judah concerning the words, the book has been found for great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us because of the father, because of our fathers have not obeyed the word of this book to do according to all that is written in it. So as, as it's being writ, as it's being read, Josiah is hearing these words where God is saying over and over and over again, this is my covenant with you that I will keep, but you have a role to play as well, which is to follow the covenant. And if you don't, you know, God is kind of laying out like, Hey, if you don't do this, you, we're going to have, we're going to struggle. Uh, and so Josiah is looking back on, you know, his fathers and grandfathers and going, oh gosh, we, we, we're in a bad way. We right. are in a bad way. Well, and there was this understanding within the Jewish law that fun fact is not true for us anymore. So let me just preface it with that. But we, we think about uh, generational blessings or generational curses in the old Testament. And we're like, okay, so the disobedience of one person continues to visit up to seven generations, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I think so. And so uh, it was actually a thing that came up in Jesus' ministry where he's clearly like, yeah, not a thing anymore. Like, I'm ending that. Uh, but here in Josiah's ex experience, he's like, guys, in this covenant relationship that we have with God, our obedience echoes and our disobedience echoes into the next generation. Now, I would say this today, well, we don't have a spiritual blessing or cursing attached to generational history. We do have legacy that we continue or that we change. So it's not it's not like some sort of spiritual hex that's getting put on people, but 
the way that you lead and live your home, right? When we think about the proverbs, the principles of the, the way that things go, right? Teach your child how they should go when they're young and when they're old, they will not depart from it. That doesn't mean it's not a promise, it's a principle. So the principle of this idea is still true, but it is not a unshakable, um, uh, unshakable curse the right. way that Josiah is identifying it for the moment that he's living in. Yeah, yeah, that's good. So then uh, Josiah sends them to, and let's see, to a prophetess, um, Hulda the prophetess. And uh, she is going to kind of interpret for the king uh, what, what God is going to do through this. Uh, and so she says, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, tell the man who sent you to me, thus says the Lord, this is verse 16, Behold, I will bring disaster upon this place and upon its inhabitants and all the words of the book uh, that the king of Judah has read because they have forsaken me and have made offerings to other gods. So here we're going to find out what's going on here, uh, that they might provoke me to anger with all the work of their hands. Therefore, my wrath will be kindled against this place and it will not be quenched. That does not feel super promising. I mean, it feels like a promise, <laughs> just not yeah. the one you want to hear. Yeah. Um, but she does add on to here, and, and, and this is from God, but to the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord, uh, thus so shall you say to him, thus says the Lord God, the God of Israel, regarding the words you have read, uh, because your heart was penitent and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard how I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they should become a desolation and a curse and you have torn your clothes and wept before me, I also have heard you, declares the Lord. And so it, it is this really unique picture, you know, because here, here we can we can put God in a box and say, just like I thought, just like I thought. You mess up and he's against you. And, th and then we see this here where it's this reminder, and we talked about it uh, with Moses and with Israel in Egypt, God hears us, he sees us, and he is paying attention. He, he is redeeming us, um, and he wants us to be humble before him. He knows we're going to mess up. How do we respond when we recognize that? And so uh, because of Josiah's response, there is a little bit of a, of a break um, before all of this is going to happen. And, and this is before Josiah has done anything else. This is just the, the humility that he shows before the Lord, um, understanding the gravity of the sin of his nation and, and his people. Yeah. And I think basically what we kind of skip forward to, right. Is that the, the, all of a sudden Josiah from this, starts to have kind of like Bible conferences, right? Because like we've talked about, nobody can read this. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, frankly, a bunch of people are illiterate, but nobody can read this because they don't have access to it. And so they literally just like have times where they're going to stand up and read the first five books of the Bible. Like that's, that's all they're doing. But the crazy thing is that for the vast majority of people who heard it, other than like the excerpts, right? The coffee cup verses, the things that they would have said, coming and going, the things that might've been on their doorpost still, other than that stuff, they'd never heard it before. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that is this monumental change of, hey, God's got uh, 613 commands for us to adhere to. So we should start doing them, you know, yeah. and uh, pretty incredible, right? Like, all right, this is the covenant that God's, he's never broke it with us, but we've broken it with him a bunch, let's change. And then uh, the crazy thing that I think about in verse four uh, is that what what, is, what it sees is there's like a whole bunch of idols, and where do the idol where the idols ended up? Well, a lot of them are in the house of the Lord, in the temple. Which, I mean, even the most ignorant person, you've got to believe knew better than that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know. And at the same time, I can look at my own heart and be like, oh yeah, but but I keep idols in my heart and my heart is the temple of, of, of God. So like, it's, it's easy to pass judgment on people here, but if we're gonna, if we're really gonna apply it, we have to look inward and say, what does that look like in my life? 
because yeah. sorry guys we're no better no um we want to be we want to be josiah here we're we're judah <laughs> yeah or worse northern or worse. <laughs> and I, what i think is really interesting too phil is um the role that the priests played in all of this right because it, they were almost executors of this behavior right uh those idols don't get in the temple on their own well it's, it's always it's them. always syncretism right like within judaism they were still practicing patterns and habits that would have been connected to historic judaism sure but they were also doing some other stuff. And I think that is a huge indictment for us today to be able to take us to take a step back and say, what is the syncretism that exists today? I think the, the, the biggest syncretism that we see right now um, in our in our current context, I think, is nationalism and faith. And so like, no matter what your political affiliation is, this isn't taking a shot at one person or another, but it's understanding where is my true citizenship? Like if my citizenship is truly in heaven, it doesn't mean I don't vote. It doesn't mean I'm not informed. It doesn't mean I'm not involved, but it means it, it, inf it informs how I'm involved. Yeah. And, uh, and I think sometimes we talk about this before that when we view our faith through the lens of our politics, rather than the other way around, it gets us in trouble and it, it starts to take you down paths like this. I think the other one is identity, uh, where we see people place something other than Jesus as the center of identity. And I'm not talking about people that don't know Jesus. Of course, they're doing that. What's the alternative? But for those of us who are followers of Jesus, your identity is that you're an image bearer of the creator of the universe, created in his image with infinite dignity, value, and worth. And so what is it that shifts into that place? I'm that except for my sexuality. I'm that except for my job. I'm that except for my accomplishments. Like what's the thing that's taking up residence? And we've just made all of these convenient 21st century conservative evangelicalism uh, uh, acceptable sins. Uh, and I think th that that two area of nationalism and identity shift, those two things have really done this same thing, in my opinion, to us. So, yeah. you know. Uh, Dom here said, application, what have I allowed to crowd out the Bible and my walk with God? Where am I allowing things um, to compete with my time with God and stunt my walk and learning to be more like him? Yeah, I think that's a good question because it is it is always like, you know, the, the thing I always used to talk about with students was you have this shelf in your heart that's the, that's like what's actually guiding and controlling you. And it's a really small shelf. And what what students and what everybody wants to do is we want to put something else on that shelf. We want to put that relationship. We want to put that mm -hmm. celebration. We want to put that priority, that goal, that possession. And the lie we tell ourselves is that I'm just going to ask God to share the shelf with this other thing. God's still there, but there's only one thing. There's only room for one thing on that shelf. And so when you put whatever else that person is or that thing is on the shelf, it does. It crowds out God. He, he bumps off the shelf. And what does it look like to put them back? And then everything else, that's the Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and everything else will figure itself out. So, hmm. all right. So idols, let's get rid of them. Let's burn them. Uh, but don't skip verse five. Uh, he disposed of the priests. Oh. <laughs> I mean, and there's another place uh, where it talks about that he, he executed them. Like, Josiah was not messing around. Right. And, and you think about it, Phil, this is in his 18th year. So I'm assuming of his reign. So he's 26 years 26, old. Yeah. I mean, at 26 years old, I was not, I was not doing any of this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was surviving as a public school teacher. Okay. Um, but, but you look at this and you think he was, I mean, he, he wasn't just saving face in front of God for a minute, uh, no. going through the motions and implementing some new ideas. He was taking this very, very seriously. And he was sweeping the nation of idols. We'll talk more about like Asherah stuff, um, child sacrifice, altars to false gods. And anyone who was involved in that, who was leading the charge on that, they're done too. Right. Well, and I think, you know, there's he not only saw how difficult things were, uh, like how, how difficult things were at the time that he wanted to see change, but he also knew the promised judgment if things didn't change. Right. And so he's like, guys, we can't 
Like you think things are bad now. Like I'm not, I'm not trying to just like fix what is now. I'm trying to avoid a future that none of us want. And yes, this feels severe and difficult, but I promise it is way less severe and difficult than if we do nothing. And I think that's the hard part, even in our own pursuit of God, is that we go like, God, I just don't know that I want, you know, insert thing. I don't know that I want to give up. I don't, but it's like, yeah, yeah. The alternative of you going your own way is a lot more painful. And so I think, you know, we get to see that highlighted here. Dom said, Phil, making, we make justifying other things an Olympic sport. I mean, I do like that. We all do, right? We, we end up in these spots and we're like, wait, how did I, how did I do that? Why did I think I was entitled to that? Why do I, why did I think I deserved it? Um, but these like little subtle motivational excuses that at, over time bring us to a place of making very, very bad choices. And so, it's really easy because we, we can justify it with people around us too. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Right. I, well, cause I mean, especially when you're a Christian, right. You, you look around and you, you don't even have to look at non-Christians. You look at like mm -hmm. other Christians, other people that claim to follow Jesus. And you're like, I'm doing way better than they're doing. So that must be fine. And Jesus is like, right. they're not the goal, bro. So, all right. The other go. thing that I find very interesting, cause Hezekiah was a King, um, just a few generations before Josiah. And he was also a, a good King. Um, but as you're reading, his story starts in second Kings 18, but as you're reading through what Hezekiah did, he did a lot of the same things, but it says he left some of the high places or he, like, he didn't get rid of everything. Right. And I don't know if Josiah knew any of that or not, but we see that because Hezekiah left some of it, it was able, as soon as he died, all the stuff came back again. Um, yeah. whereas well, with Josiah, I mean he's like. When we think about what God did to bring Israel to the promised land and even what they what God had them do underneath David's leadership, where it was like, hey, I need you to go into this civilization, into this culture, and I need you to destroy it, kill everyone. And to us, we're like, oh, my gosh, like, why would yeah. you do that? That seems so insane, you know, to us, to our sensitivities. But God's like, here's what happens when you don't do it that way, when you don't do it that way, when you leave just a little bit, it's going to create little weeds that are going to grow and infect yeah. everything. And so because of it, it's like we're just constantly cutting weeds out rather than digging stuff up at the roots. And you see this over and over and over again in the life of Israel. And I mean, it's our focus for the entire year, right? <laughs> like thorny soil in our own heart. This yeah. same thing happens to us. If we do not deal strictly, if we do not make war with the brokenness and sin in our life, it will keep coming back. And we convince ourselves mm -hmm. that it's fake growth, or we convince ourselves that we've taken control of it. We have not taken control of it. It has taken care of us. Crystal, Phil, that really shows uh, how he is constantly shepherding humanity over and over. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, how many times um, has God had to have this same conversation with civilizations, with his own people, with you and me, where it's like, hey, I, I told you, like, I showed you this doesn't work. I showed you all the bad stuff that would happen because of it. Ah, and you're doing it again. <laughs> you know, like, I, I think the the incredible grace and patience of God is, in, is I mean, it should, it should pour out this overwhelming um, gratitude from us. But I think it should also help us understand the severity with which we need to deal with a divided heart inside of ourselves. Yeah. And then Debbie said, uh, we often like to say, I'm so much better than I was. Yeah, absolutely. And I think th like, there's nothing wrong with that. Like, that's a great thing to reflect on. But if we're saying it as a justification for areas we know God still wants to work on, but we don't want him to work on, that's when that's not as helpful a statement. Right. So, all right. So Josiah's on a rampage. What does he do next? So, I mean, that's what he, you're right. Like I said, he's just, he's going, he's going for it. Um, and then we get to verse 21. Is that where you wanted to go? Or did you want to stop? Oh, did you want to go before that? We can uh, talk about the prostitutes. Yeah. Yeah. I think we should talk. Yeah. Verse seven. Yeah. So, I mean, again, uh, so you jump even up to verse six and he brought out the Asherah from the house of the Lord. Again, pay attention to where that is. It's not just random in the country somewhere. It's in the house of the Lord. And then it says, and he broke down the houses of the male cult prostitutes who were in, in the house of the Lord. Mm. Uh, and then verse eight brought all the priests, de um, defiled all the high places where the priests had made offerings 
and broke down all the high places. So, I mean, male cult, cult prostitutes. prostitutes. We talk, we in talk, we like to think because we live in today and, and we know today, we like to think that today is so much worse than it was back then. Um, but, but we romanticize what back then looked like. And when you really get down to it, it was not good. Right. It's just like, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's amazing to see though, the power that God's word had in Josiah's life, right? Mm -hmm. Because he saw all this stuff his whole life, right? Like he, yeah. he took over at eight. He was reigning as King all through his teenage years into his twenties. And there would have been a handoff. He became King at eight, but until his bat mitzvah, like kind of that age of 12 or 13, probably he's like, there's advisors around him that are doing stuff, but he's like, he's fully in charge. And then he, he sees the Torah and God opens his eyes. And now all these things he's seen his whole life, he understands differently and understands the scale at which he needs to deal with them. And I just think like, man, God, would you open, like my prayer from a passage like this is like, God, would you open my eyes like that? Mm -hmm. Would you help me see the things in my life that have just become the wallpaper yeah. that I like need to change, but over time it's become acceptable and we're even better than some other people. Like we have way less cult male prostitutes than that civilization does, you know, but to be able to take a step back and go, God, where have we compromised? Where have we taken a sidestep that you're challenging us to put you back on the throne? So. Well, and one of the themes that we've brought out uh, just just throughout the Bible says series is this idea of sexual sin and how prevalent it was and how destructive right. it can be. And so, uh, you know, it's just another reminder. Um, this is not God's best for us. Well, and it's the difference right between descriptive and prescriptive. So a lot of what we see in the Old Testament um, somebody, you know, it's easy for folks to go like, Hey, people had multiple wives and somebody had a bunch of concubines and here's male prostitutes. And it's like, yeah, yeah this wasn't the way it was supposed to be. <laughs> this is describing, this is describing a historic moment, um, and that God is bringing judgment to, and that Josiah is working away from. Right. And so I think there's something so important for us to understand. And even in today's context, right. One of the arguments against a sexual ethic that Jesus would have any sort of sexual ethic that we still comply to in, in, you know, the year 2020 uh, is that, Hey, this, this is so different uh, than what they would have understood, you know, back when this was, this kind of stuff was being written. They only had sexual expressions that looked like this. They only had objectification. They only, but well, this existed, this was not the only expression of this that existed. But what we see over and over and over again is that the callback to God's original design for sexuality was a part of how God was bringing his people back to him. Uh, Dom's got a, a nugget here for us. He said, not to beat this to death, but there's an important point. God chooses to bless us and give us good things as a part of our relationship with him and in order to be in relationship with us. But too many times when we grow as a result of his grace, we use our newfound whatever to justify that we're, an, uh, we're enough alone and set off without him. We need to remember that as we walk with God, the goal is to stay in relationship with him, not to reach ramming speed to set off on our own. Absolutely. And that's, I mean, we talked about Gideon yesterday. It's exactly what Gideon did. Like, it was like God gave him this great victory. And it was like, cool, man. And it was, it was almost like he looked over his shoulder. It's like, God, I got it now. Thanks. Thanks for the help. Um, and unfortunately, we see that is still a, a way in which people approach faith in Jesus. When we look at a book like Galatians, where Paul basically says, What is wrong with you guys? Like you had this so good at the beginning, and at some point you decided that like what got you here isn't what's going to get you there. And so you're like, God, I got it now. And you exchanged grace for work. And that is not the way God wants it to be. So, yeah. Yep. And I didn't make this plug earlier. If you missed yesterday or any other, other episode, you can go check it out on our YouTube page. All right. So a bunch of folks are out of the, out of the temple. Amazing stuff continues to get rid of things that shouldn't be here. Where do you want to jump next in Josiah's life? Well, I'd love to jump in at 21 um, because this is where I mean, you think about you think about today and the the importance still of the Passover um, in the Jewish tradition. And here it says, and the king commanded all the people keep the Passover. Um, it hadn't been kept since the day, like 
for generations, they hadn't observed the Passover. Um, where we where we look back and we remember who God is, what he did uh, with the Israelites when they were in exile in Egypt, or not exile, but in captivity in Egypt. A huge, a huge, huge, huge um, momentous occasion. And God says, we talked about it on Monday. Hey, I'm implementing this. This is how it's all going to go down. And I want you to remember this forever. Right. Um, and they just, they just didn't. Yeah. Uh had not been kept since the days of the judges who judged Israel. Which like to us, that's yesterday for them. Long time, <laughs> long and, time. And think of who's come in, in between all that. Yep. David was there. Right. Solomon was there. Like yep. all, all those guys came in between and we're talking about since the judges. I mean, and the Passover, even if you know Jewish people today, even people that are uh, language you may not know about. So in within modern day Judaism, you have Orthodox on one end of the spectrum and Reformed on the other end of the spectrum. And so if you think about that in like Christian world terms, Reformed like means something way different. A Reformed Jewish person is somebody that would um, have like they they embrace aspects of their faith and tradition, um, but they are not going to be people typically that wear yarmulkes or eat kosher or even celebrate the feasts and festivals. Uh, they, they, they're a little bit more choosy about how they observe it. But even on that end of the spectrum, this end of the spectrum of the reform side uh, of Judaism, they still celebrate Passover like it is it is what Christmas is for Christians. Passover is for Jewish people. So the fact that that one got like put on the ash heap is crazy. Like crazy. I don't know how that happened. This is the, it would be like, you know, how many generations would it take in America for us to stop celebrating or remembering Christmas? That's what we're talking about. And I mean, and they're not even just kind of like half heartedly celebrating oh. it. It's just not a thing. The kids, the kids that do this when Josiah turns 26 are like, what is this? What is this for? And, and that is why God put these feasts and festivals in place was for one generation because they didn't have access to the scriptures. Remember for one generation to tell the next generation about God's faithfulness throughout all generations. And so when those things dropped away, it became easier and easier to compromise what it meant to stay connected to the true God of Israel versus all these false gods of all these other cultures that had made their way in. And because they were disobedient and didn't live the separate way that God had called them to, it just became easier and easier to let competing ideas take over. So, yeah. Uh, all right. Did you see this, by the way, Crystal dropped in a Domism right there. She did. The main thing, the main thing. I'm, I'm on board. I'm on board. And like, I mean, I'm so proud. Yeah. His yeah. protege. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, where do you want to go from here, ma'am? Yeah, I mean, you can see just in 24, um, it, it talks just a little bit about uh, mediums, necromancers, I think is how you say it, and then household gods. So not only were were the idols in the temple, but they were also um, in people's homes. And so they were worshiping actual, tangible, physical things in their homes. Uh, but then in verse 25, and I underline this because it, this is what got us to one of the original things that we talked about this morning is why does it Josiah get a lot more shout outs than he gets? Um, but it says here before him, before Josiah, there was no king like him. Right. Uh, let's think about who came before him. David, Solomon, even Hezekiah gets a little more attention. Yep. Uh, no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise after him, which is not shocking because they go into exile very soon here. Yeah. Well, but I mean, says, when we think about really good Kings, like David, right. We think about David, great guy, but we have like, there's a pretty big asterisk, right? Like if David's in the mm -hmm. hall of fame of Kings, like there's a pretty big asterisk there. Like your eye is calling from <laughs> beyond. The grave, like, hey, uh, yeah. <laughs> like after God's own heart, but like not always, you know? And so what's amazing about Josiah is this is like an unqualified. He crushed it his whole life. Yeah. Took over eight and was just faithful. And you're like, God, how do, how do I get that? How do we get that? How do we live? It is possible to live like this your entire life. I mean, I just think that it's it's amazing to see that somebody did it. Now, it doesn't mean he was perfect. He wasn't Jesus, no. uh, but, but he was committed to doing it the right way. 
And the thing that I think is amazing, and I hope this brings us uh, a glimmer of hope today, is he was not raised in, you know, we would say in a Christian home. He was not raised in the ways of God. Right. His his father was evil in the eyes of the Lord. And so, and his grandfather too. So we, we look at Josiah and what I love about this is that there is so much power in, in God's word. And then also in that relationship with God to totally transform a life. Right. Um, we just have to be willing to let him work in us, which is, I think, what we see in Josiah when he humbles himself, when he tears his clothes in mourning, right. um, when he goes through and and makes big, big changes. He doesn't care what people think or are saying about him. I'm sure they thought he was crazy because the people didn't know either. Generation after generation after generation had wandered further and further and further away from God. And by the time we get to Josiah's life, they almost didn't know anything. And, and he is just willing to let God captivate himself in such a way that he then um, makes huge changes in an entire country. Uh, and here, it's, and, and it's here's, powerful. The, here's the crazy thing. Like as amazing as all that is, the contrast between how God uses present day in what's often referred to as the church age or the grace age and the way that he functioned with Israel is that today... When people are like, oh, hurricane, God's judgment. No, mm. not the way God works. Like broken world, for sure. Is God going to use it? Absolutely. He's going to use all things to work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. Absolutely. He's on. He's all in on that stuff, for sure. Yeah. But anytime some crazy televangelist comes on, he's like, this is because of the whatever. Like, what are you talking about? What they're doing is they're ta tapping into the covenantal relationship that God had with Israel. Hmm. And so what we see in verse 26 is Josiah killed it his entire life yeah. and basically wasn't good enough. Oh, remember all that judgment that we read about? The wrath of God that was going to be poured against unrighteousness, that God is a just God, that he's going to eradicate this. He's still that guy. And so he does. Well, and I read this um, and I thought it was just a, a great quote. It says, God has not failed his people. His people, led by their kings that they asked for, have failed their God. The covenants, after all, have the contingency of Israel's faithfulness written into them. But the covenant also promise, promises return from exile for those who return to Yahweh. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's this winnowing all the time that we see. And I would say God doesn't just stop it with Israel. I think he still does it. The word for Israel that we see is the word remnant, right? That God will often take Israel and then like the entire nation will go into captivity or into exile or whatever, whether it's Egyptian exile or in this case, Babylonian exile. And then God is working to create a remnant of people that will be faithful, that on the other side of that discipline, because remember, disobedience leads to discipline. Mm -hmm. On the other side of that discipline, those who are pursuing God will come out of it closer to God rather than further from him. And mm -hmm. I think that the, the connection for us today is whether it's, what's going on for you personally, what's happening for our nation, what's happening for the church in America. What does it look like for God to uh, reveal a remnant of people that will continue to stay faithful to him, even when syncretism, mm -hmm. even when competing worldviews, even when rationalized sins become okay within the broader movement of faith? That's good. Uh, Dom said, yeah, I mean, you know, if we'd learned nothing from yesterday, God can do a lot with a little. Yeah. You know, he winnows down that army of 32,000 to 300. 300. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, and, and, and we'll see a very similar thing that he, that God does with this remnant. It, it doesn't take a lot for God to move. It, it was 11 men who carried the gospel forward after Jesus was gone. I mean, right. it, he can do a lot with a little. And so what of ourselves are we willing to give God? Cause he can do a lot with a little. Right. Well, because at the end of the day, God doesn't God doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. He's not using us because he's desperate. Yep. He's using us because he chooses us. Yep. And so like all of a sudden, oh, God, I get it. Like, let me 
let me let me place myself in submission to you. This will be a lot healthier. One of the things Liz and I say all the time is that we we can place value on we get to do this with God yeah. over we have to do this. And when you switch your mindset to this is an opportunity that I have that God allows me to be a part of, right? It's just a totally different way of looking at what you get to do. Right. There there are times even for our church staff where I've made the statement. Uh, there are lots of churches, most churches that pray for our problems. So like. There are things that are like, oh, this is difficult. I don't know how we're going to solve this. Ooh, this is a lot, whatever. And and the problems that we have are prayers of other people. And I would say that extends to your personal life as well, where God is showing up, what God is doing, how God is providing for you. It's easy to look towards somebody else and go, I don't have, I'm not there. I haven't accomplished. This isn't all better yet. But to be able to say, you know what? People today are praying for your problems. And uh, for you to understand that perspective, I think, and help make that shift of, I get to do this. I get to experience what I have today, where I am today, the opportunities that are in front of me today, uh, because God's placed me here. And it's all a blessing. Yeah. Dom said, uh, although none of us uh, will be mentioned in the Bible uh, as Josiah was, this passage shows us the direct impact that one person can have uh, when they choose uh, to wholeheartedly follow God without distractions. This was an eight-year-old, right? Makes me think of Andy Stanley's statement, we don't know what stands in the balance of our decision to follow the burden that God has placed on our heart. Absolutely. Totally agree. Totally agree. I remember I heard Andy Stanley preach that message. He preaches about Nehemiah and um, when he builds the wall. And I remember the first time I heard him preach that message, it was like at a catalyst. And I honestly, I walked out and wept, you know, like it was just this like weight of, hey, all these things that we do to to push that stuff down, to just continue to live a respectable life and to stay on track and to do what's safe and comfortable, not what God calls us to do. Awesome. Well, hey, uh, I hope this has been a helpful conversation about Josiah and kind of the period of the Kings. Obviously we covered this much, um, but hopefully this week is, is a helpful survey of kind of these movements. Um, if you are not familiar kind of with the overall genres of the Bible, uh, we did an entire series on Bible study that's linked in inside of this document and on our YouTube page where we talk about all the different genres. So that may be helpful for you if you haven't checked that out. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about application, kind of what do we do with this? And so if you have prayer requests, things we can be praying for, or ways that we can uh, apply this together, just drop those in the comments and our executive producer, Crystal, will help. So, uh, all right. So, Lisa, how about you? What are you thinking about? Yeah, well, the, the thing that's just been kind of ruminating, or ruminating with me is... Um, where have I allowed distractions to take me off course? And and I've heard it said by multiple pastors, I think it's it's very frequently used, but you know, it doesn't take much of a shift to get a ship off course. And so it it looks like you're still moving in the right direction, but even just a, a hair off, the ship is not going in the right direction and it will not end up where it needs to go. And what feels like a, a, a small compromise or what feels like a small distraction uh, it has the potential to be very devastating um, yeah. if I don't course correct quickly. That's good. That's good. Uh, Eileen's got one for us here. She said, well, Josiah finally did what was uh, his previous, what his previous father should have done. He didn't finish the job. And this shows again and again, uh, that when I put my trust in the things of this world, even if they're good kings doing good things, they will eventually disappoint. Yet, I know this. I continue to uh, appoint and follow those kings in my life. I continue to think these things will save me based on where I spend my time and what I think. What are the high place idols and good kings that I'm putting in God's place in my heart? And how can I get rid of those and follow the king that ultimately will satisfy that what I'm chasing. No big deal. Just, you know, dropping some bombs. Fine. <laughs> yeah. I think that's fantastic. And understanding like maybe the person you're, you're really hoping wins the presidential election in November wins. Cool. Like congratulations, right? Still not God. And so how do you make sure even when the systems of this world comply with the expectations you have, that your ultimate hope still sits in Jesus, not just, you know, lip service, but, actually a thing. 
Uh, prayer request from Crystal here. Will you pray for the wildfires that this cold front works to largely contain them? Absolutely. We've been praying for that even as a family. I think that's the the silver lining, hopefully, in this early freeze for us here in Colorado is well, I'm like, sure, we need snow, but like let's let's go around us to all these fires. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Anything else, ma'am? Um I think that's all I've got today. Okay. And I listed well, some. Of I, our... Okay, actually, I have one more thing. Okay, Sorry. no, you're good. You know, if I say no, I've always got one more thing. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I really, really, really like to do as I'm reading through the Old Testament, so that I don't get distracted by the stories, is to constantly be looking for God's character in all of this. And so, what is God's character revealing to me in this episode? of the Kings because like I pointed out, it's so easy to find what we don't enjoy about God and then make assumptions on that. What else can we pull out of this? Where do we see God's faithfulness, his steadfast love? Um, how do we see God moving and operating through Josiah and in turn through the people? I mean, the, these people are not too far off from going into exile. What does this moment in time help them and help them to remain faithful to God in, in uh, captivity? It's good. That's really good. I would also say on the flip side, right? Josiah had this really interesting, um, you know, this really interesting perspective of everything that had to change. And he, he delivered a bunch of change to make things better and to hopefully avoid future judgment but that judgment was coming. Like yeah. the wrath of God was going to be poured out against wickedness. And, and, and he tells he tells the prophetess that right away. Right. right. Like, hey, and, I'm going to spare Josiah because of, of his faithfulness here. But right. I mean, once he's gone, it's go time. But like, here's the thing. The situation is shockingly similar for us in that judgment is going to be poured out against all unrighteousness in our world. The wrath of God is coming. And so this idea of like, not just how do we suppress um, and hold back some of the effects of sin in our world, which we should be doing, working for redemption and reconciliation. How do we do all that? Absolutely. But then at the same time, the reason that Jesus is central to what we do, the reason that we want other people to know about Jesus is because the wrath of God is coming. And so I, I think this is just a reminder of like, yeah, but like, would God really do that? You know, like, is that, yes, he, for really good reason, like, his justice actually demands it in order to create this restored heaven, this renewed earth, in order for this eternity to be the picture that God has always envisioned it and planned it to be. It requires that judgment. And so helping people to understand, like, we want to be on the right side of that judgment. Uh, Pam, pray for my eldest daughter and three children involved in a lifetime of abuse from their dad. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, now X right now in court, we'll be praying for them. That is, if you drop in your daughter's name, we'll be praying for her by name. Uh, Jeanette, I'm praising God uh, that my back feels much better this week. That is fantastic. So good. So glad to hear that. And then Jackie said, this reminds me of when we were talking about abiding in God. It's so much easier to discern the voice of God when we are connected to him. I love it in John 17, when Jesus prays, for all believers in the future, that they may be one, Father, just as you and me are one, and I may be, in, and and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Wouldn't that be an incredible thing, Jackie? To see believers of every political persuasion, to see believers of every background, every ethnicity, uh, to see men and women come together as followers of Jesus that can disagree on so much, but say what binds us. What unites us is far greater than anything that could that could divide us, and that's what Paul talks about in Galatians, right? That now there is this there is this new unity we're able to have because of this new connection we have in Him. Uh, let's see here, Carol. How do you access YouTube for Eastern Hills? Uh, I'll post a couple links for you. There's like the normal Eastern Hills YouTube that has services. I'll drop that in for you, and then there's the YouTube that has archives for this. I'll drop both on for you. Um, and then, oh, there we go. Her name is Christina. We'll be praying for Christina. Thank you. Yeah. Jackie, uh, absolutely to me, abiding is the absolute center of our relationship with him. Abiding equals his plan, his way, uh, his timing. 
<clears throat> we are most connected when we are living from this space. And remember what Jesus says in that, right? Apart from me, disconnected from me, not abiding in me, you can do nothing. You may have a lot of activity, but you will not have productivity. You are not actually functioning in the spirit and plan of God. Uh, and then Greg, pray for Catherine's family, Pete's wife, um, Pete's late wife and uh, family for sure. Yeah. Uh, and then it looks like Crystal dropped in. The, hey, thanks, Crystal. That's nice. Awesome. Well, just a reminder, everybody, we are uh, going to be back with you tomorrow. We'll talk about um, kind of the next conversation in the Old Testament together. Um, but for Aurora, still a thing. If you want to be involved, Deb, I think I saw you on here earlier. If you're still here, feel free to drop whatever folks can bring this week. Uh, continuing to help and care for people. If you need help or know someone who does, reach out. We'd love to try to make that happen. All right, everybody, I am going to pray for us, and we will uh, head on with the rest of our day. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for this group. Thank you for even on a snowy morning. Uh, people from around the country can join us. We can um, dive in live or later and uh, learn from um, this incredible leader in Josiah. What an amazing young man that grew into an incredible king uh, that returned people back to your word, that can return people back to your character. I pray, God, that you would give us the same conviction today to do the same thing. Would you help us, God, to be able to see what you've called us to be, where you've called us to go, how you've called us to shape what it means for our lives and our church and your people for this generation. God, we pray for um, the specific prayer requests that got surfaced this morning. Pray for the wildfires around our state. I think about even on the West Coast. Um, that you would give first responders safety today, that you would help bring those things under control. In Colorado, God, would you help this cold front to move to a place where it can be really helpful and help contain those fires? We pray for Christina, Pam's oldest daughter, and the three kids that uh, are in court right now. I don't know all the um, uh, implications of this particular hearing, God, but I pray that the truth would win, uh, that those kids and, and that Christina would be safe, God, and that whatever the next steps look like there, uh, that they would sense you in them, that they would find support from you and people of you to be able to uh, find whatever this next this next day, this next week, this next month is going to look like for them. Thank you so much for Jeanette's back feeling better. We pray for um, continued healing and continued relief there, God, and we just celebrate uh, the work of doctors and medical treatments and your own spirit to help bring her peace and comfort in that. And we pray for Catherine as she continues to grieve Pete's passing and pray for her family uh, as they process that. We pray for Greg too, that you'd let him um, just see it's okay for him to grieve, to feel in the midst of this. That it doesn't need to be done anytime soon. He can keep feeling it, keep experiencing it. Um, God, we thank you so much for all of this, the time that we have to be able to gather this way. We love you. It's in Jesus name. Amen. And then while I was praying, Debbie put on here that she's looking for soups. So if you want to help out, grab some soup, bring it by. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We will see you tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Have a great day.